when our speakers <laughs> when our speakers uh, give us permission, we do like to record their their talks and we put them up on YouTube, and we encourage uh, anybody who's attending to subscribe to that to that channel. Uh, Wyatt Widmer uh, is talking about wild city human ecosystem with a uh, focus on Wolf Road Prairie, which we're very excited to hear. We want to continue giving thanks to Seven Generations Ahead. Uh, they have provided the uh, Zoom facilities for us to use for these presentations, and they also uh, offer generous financial support. And I should say emotional also for uh, all our many uh, programs and projects that we do. Uh, we also would like to thank our paid membership for making this program possible. Uh, we are a volunteer organization and uh, our members really do help us uh, fund and carry out our programs, uh, which include these monthly talks. Uh, we do special conferences uh, currently on hiatus uh, because of the pandemic. We do our very popular spring uh, plant sale and fall uh, shrub and tree sale. We have our yearly native garden tour in July and we were in person again this year after last year having to take a year off and or do it video by video. And we also are involved with various community projects, um, helping people uh, plant gardens, uh, helping community organizations, uh, teach young, young people and children about native gardening. Um, and we also give out grants. Uh, our grant uh, program uh, uh, application period begins, I believe, in February. So uh, if, you're, if you get our uh, newsletter, you will be hearing more about it and we'll, we will publicize that. I'd also, uh, if anybody's listening who is a member, we are putting out once again, a call for volunteers. Uh, there's eight, nine people on the board and we do a lot of work, but we also always need folks to help us out. We need folks to help us with uh, um, our various sales, our programs, our projects. Uh, you can go to our website and uh, we have an application form and we also have a list of different kinds of skill sets that uh, you might be willing to, to offer. Uh, so check that out. And if you have a little bit of time and you want to be more involved with Wild Ones, but you're not quite ready to step up to being a board member, we welcome any and all involved. Um, there's, there's some issues going on, I'm hearing, if whoever's moving things around could please mute themselves. I want to remind everybody the uh, Bell Bowl Prairie, we've been talking about this for a while, it's the small patch of uh, remnant gravel prairie that is uh, sort of enclosed by the uh, uh, Rockford Airport facility and it has been threatened, it's right now uh, the, the they were going to start um, construction, but it's on high, temporary hiatus. Uh, we encourage everyone to go to savebellbowlprairie.org and uh, look up what the issue is. Uh, as we famously know, um, and Wyatt will be talking about how precious our remnant prairies are and how, for a prairie state, how little prairie we actually have anymore. So please do check that out. It's, it's another... Um, it's another cause that's really worth uh, familiarizing yourself with. So now with little further ado, we will have Wild City Human Ecosystem, Wolf Road Prairie with Wyatt Widmer. Wyatt is, the, is a director of Save the Prairie Society. He's a volunteer steward of Wolf Road Prairie Nature uh, Preserve. He's also a writer, poet and producer of educational content about natural sciences, ecosystems, and their human connections. So take it away, Wyatt. All right, well, let me first start off by um, getting my screen shared with you here. So doing things a little bit differently today where it's going to be somewhat of a, um, there we go. It's gonna be somewhat of a video presentation. Um, I did try to make the, the video optimized for this kind of format, but if it's, 
if you're experiencing any latency or anything, just try making the window smaller. Um, otherwise, I will be pausing at key moments and everything so you can really tell what's going on on screen if it does appear a little laggy for you. But yeah, I'm Wyatt Widmer, also known as Wyatty Coyote. You can uh, check me out on Instagram or YouTube. And if uh, you follow any of Save the Prairie Society's social media, that's going to be um, my content as well. So um, I have a lot of gratitude to Wild Ones for making this presentation possible. And um, I really hope that it gets to you guys and encourages you to believe in a lot of what we believe in here at Wolf Road Prairie. Um, this is my first planned, not off the cuff presentation. So, um, you know, thanks for, uh, for checking in. Um, but I guess we'll just get right into it. So, um, yeah, let's see. Our neighborhoods are important to us, right? Our houses, our families, our bodies, our city. We think a lot about these things because for our purposes, we should. Today, we're thinking about ecosystems. Every living and non-living thing that shares Chicagoland here uh, with us it's easy to think about what matters to us, but the hardest thing is changing how we think about what matters to us. So what do you imagine when you think of Chicagoland before European settlement? Are there a lot of people? Um, is it a vast empty wilderness kind of untouched by man? Sometimes that distinction between natural and artificial is just as imaginary as our perceptions of America before America. The great vast wilderness of Illinois entirely at the whim of the weather and awaiting revelation of its incomparable fertility it was just not so. Like most of Europe, it was a great cultural landscape created with and stewarded by a variety of sophisticated societies. And as far as we can tell, these societies, as were encountered by the Europeans, perceived no difference between their needs and those of any other living things. These people, i.e. the Miamia, Kickapoo and the Confederates of the Council of Three Fires, which governed the Ojibwa, Odawa, and Potawatomi tribes, perceived no difference between civilization and nature, society and ecosystem. So here in Westchester, Illinois, at Wolf Road Prairie State Nature Preserve and the Hickory Lane buffer lands, which are just to the west of it, we see their work live on. We see the solutions to an uncertain future awaiting us um, since long before that future was conceived. So there was no concept of a distinction between ecosystem and civilization because ecology is, by definition, the study of how all living and non-living things interact. So no one is exempt from their body. No one is exempt from an ecosystem. Everyone was a steward back then, and that stewardship was undertaken with the understanding that human alterations of the land can prove beneficial to almost all species, humans included. So where am I going with this? Well, we are already right where we belong because civilization does not exist in a vacuum, but with context. No matter what, no matter where, no matter who, the basis of that context is an ecosystem, open prairies or skyscrapers, and even our own body are all ecosystems. In the study of ecology, Things are often separated as natural and artificial, or if you want to sound like a nerd, naturopogenic and anthropogenic. Uh, let's see, that's in, that, that suffix right now, anthrope, sorry, prefix anthrope is very important because right now we're talking about the Anthropocene. That is an era when everything on earth is affected by humans. However, when humans are a keystone species, meaning that the stability of an ecosystem for other species and for themselves is upheld by that keystone species, those definitions can become unclear or perhaps even irrelevant. Today, I'm inviting you to look at your world in a way that you might not have before, wherein humans are a part of their ecosystem. Profit and growth are dependent on ecological health and thus anthropogenic alterations of our environment can ultimately be good. So today, what we're discussing is the importance of what I will hitherto call green infrastructure. You can see that on screen. 
and how we can all be stewards of green infrastructure on our own land, in our own communities, or in our own lives in general without sacrificing our quality of life. Rather, we can improve it for us and everyone else for the long haul. So this might sound like hippie woo-woo doo-da kumbaya. So let me clarify that I am not going to suggest in this presentation that you are living your life in some kind of way that's wrong. Like, I love Chicago, I love this city, and I don't want it to go away. Rather, I'm insisting that the stewardship of the ecological context on which your life is dependent will increase incrementally your quality of life. The stewardship of places like Wolf Road Prairie, like you can see here, and Hickory Lane, the abandoned oak savannas just west of the prairie. It's a shorter order than you might think, for today we'll discuss a tactic or two that by the apt use of which you might help rear our planet from the brink. That's a fat claim. So let's water it down with some background knowledge that might make big open fields like Wolf Road Prairie seem a whole lot cooler. The key concept that ecosystems, new and old alike, is biodiversity. The amount of species in a given community, the more species, the better the ecosystem because different species specialize in different functions. Think about nutrition for a second. You know that you can't eat one single food item for the rest of your life and not die. And it speaks to my point here that the poorest and most malnourished populations throughout the world often live in and or farm the most ecologically degraded regions while wealthier populations reap the benefits. Why is this? Because no single plant as nutrition makes evident can pr produce every nutrient essential to life. Any given species, not just us, requires a matrix of other species from all kingdoms of life to facilitate a healthy existence. Nutrients need to be recycled. So it stands to reason that other essential parts of ecosystems like water and air also cannot be processed by just one species. You need different species to process water at different levels. You need different species uh, and different levels in the soil and to process different pollutants within that water while providing nutrients to neighboring species that might not handle those pollutants. Same goes for air, but for simplicity, as we nail down the facts, let's stick with water. It's a little more tangible than air. So we take water for granted and yet we depend on it, yet we spend so much on it. At about half a cent per gallon, the MWRD, or for those who might not live in Chicago, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, processes enough water to keep the displays running for 60% of a day, every day. That's a lot of money. However, gray infrastructure, a shorthand for artificial infrastructure, is six to eight times more expensive and less efficient than green infrastructure with intact wetlands like those that punctuate Hickory Lane and Wolf Road Prairie and, and uh, floodplains able to clean 80 to 90 percent of particulates from flowing water. This includes about 60 percent of heavy metals. How about flooding? Do you like flooding? You didn't have to think about that too long, did you? So even just prairie can take nine inches of rain before runoff occurs. Look at that right here. That is Wolf Road Prairie, of course, and all of that water, it may look like Wolf Road Prairie is flooded because it is. And that means that the town next to it is not flooded. There was very little flooding going on in Westchester during this particular rain event because so much of it was contained right here at Wolf Road Prairie. Um, so compared to your lawn, a native garden can reduce surface runoff by 20%. That garden is cheap, easily established, personalized infrastructure and restoring just one and a half percent of a landscape to wetlands and floodplains reduces flood peaks by 29 percent. With these ecosystem services and countless more, it's been determined that over 70 percent of natural areas worldwide are more profitable to humans in the long term, about 50 years, if left undeveloped. This includes 100 percent of woodland environments. So 70% more profitable as they are in 100% of woodland environments. This is also how much of those services though are lost when that land is developed along with whatever lingering pollutants. It's easy. The more biodiverse a native ecosystem, the greater its ecosystem services. The more people doing it, the easier it gets. And not just the stewardship, but life at large. Cheaper utilities, healthier and cheaper food and water, less disasters, less environmental costs, fewer pests, less overall maintenance, easier recreation, more available public space. 
What I'm saying is that Chicago land can absolutely be a positive Chicago for the land itself. So remember that whole context thing though, these ecosystems didn't just happen. There's reasons they exist and those reasons can reveal the services they, they provide, the provisions against an uncertain future. These ecosystems took a hot minute to make like 10 to 12,000 years. The glaciers, which you can see here, the uh, geological formations that were created by the glaciers on screen right now, they came with dug up rocks and sediments and then they melted leaving this place rich with good soil. And that there is a map of all the surface deposits of the various soils that were left here over Chicagoland. And as we all know, from the month of March, melting ice means lots of water, lots of ponds, rivers, and a big old lake. So for a while, Hinsdale was a cold fir and spruce forest, LaGrange was a beach, and Brookfield was underwater, and it still is sometimes with a mile of ice on the horizon. But over time, the global climate settled into a pattern of gradual, gradual, like one to two degrees every couple of millennia fluctuations. Warmth and wet was good for prairies, while cold and dry, or sorry, warmth and wet was good for woodlands, while cold and dry was better for prairies as we see here. But Chicagoland wasn't that simple, no. Chicago's weather is never, never ever that simple. So I probably don't have to tell you too much about the weather here, but think to yourself about how extreme it really is. The Midwest has the world's widest weather fluctuations anywhere. Droughts, floods, storms, tornadoes, frosts, blizzards, intense heat, and at one time, fires all in the same place. If you think it's tough, think about the rest of life out there. But these kinds of processes are what we call natural disturbances. And by the way, on screen right there, you can see that's Wolf Road Prairie on fire. Um, which we'll get to pretty quickly here is, is not a bad thing. Um, so these are natural disturbances and everywhere has got them. All those plants out there have gotten so used to the crappy weather that they've both learned how to process it and have come to depend on these disturbances. They're the drivers of ecosystems and of evolution itself. All the functions of species that provide us with ecosystem services evolved as a response to disturbance. Rather than exploiting the ecosystems themselves, we embrace their functions. But what about artificial disturbances? Pollution, habitat destruction, soil compaction, pavement runoff, uh, development, water control, war. Just about everything we do creates an artificial disturbance, but we're not the only destructive species. Bison were too. And yet their means of destruction grass grazing, wallowing, and rut digging, which right here you can see, this is at Broken Kettle uh, Grasslands Preserve in Iowa, which I highly recommend visiting. Um, this was a rut caused by a small bison population. They started at 12 bison. Now they're over 200 over the course of 20 years. And that's what they can do right there. Um, so prairies supported uh, millions of bison from the Great Basin to the Potomac and their disturbances supported prairies. We'd probably think of that as a natural disturbance, but what if humans, i.e. the Miamia, the Potawatomi, Ojibwa, and Odawa also disturbed their prairies in mutually beneficial ways? So there's some of the bison at Broken Kettle right there. I got there right during calving season. You can see the little baby catching up to my right there. Um, agricultural, or sorry, so with the natives, agriculture and cultivation, Trailblazing, foraging, and hunting were all artificial disturbances by the natives, and none were negative. Not when they're practiced responsibly through centuries of cultural tradition, or more like millennia. They were in Chicagoland for about 8,000 years up to the present. Their greatest contribution, though, was definitely fire. Wildfires were quite rare compared to the prescribed burns that our local tribes would selectively issue in their landscape, their cultural landscape created by them. Without fire, prairie plants with deep and dense root systems would not need to be so deep and dense. Thus, they wouldn't make as complex of a filter, they wouldn't store CO2 as effectively, or be as nutrient productive as they are. And there'd probably be less species at large. Because wildfire kept the aggressive, fast-growing plants of our region from taking over, which allowed for prairies and savannas in the first place. And it allows for all organisms more access to a greater diversity of resources, which encourages the establishment of even more plants and animals to balance out that abundance. Um, 
So this only works when the ecosystem contains species adapted to such disturbances, and those species only stick around when their homes are connected to each other. So it's because of, not despite humans and bison, that the Chicago region is or was one of the most mutually benef uh, most naturally productive regions in the temperate world, even after our civilization perpetrated history's most rapid and thorough genocide of a landscape, a cultural landscape, and the cultures that upheld it, we still got a lot left over with which to work. So if you took every protected natural area within 50 miles of Chicago and made it a national park, you would have the 25th largest national park with the greatest per capita diversity of native vascular plants in the U.S. That's 1,706 species, give or take, uh, comparable to tropical forests, that is. So 380 plant species are known to live just at Wolf Road Prairie. And once upon a time, when natural wonders like the Calumet River Delta and the Lake Michigan Strand, which you can see a remnant of here, this, um, this footage is from Indiana Dunes National Park, where you can see the wetlands just after the dunes. Um, when those ecosystems were intact and unfragmented, there would have been many, many species more. This diversity is essential to civilizations everywhere, a diversity of medicinal, utilitarian, and food plants, which were cultivated by the natives using what are technically artificial disturbance regimes. Same in Europe. How do you think a lot of our invasive plants got here in the first place? Because Europeans used them for food, medicine, and utility. Now we've forgotten about these plants as well as our stewardship. The same resources and means that create a healthy and equitable society are also good for ecosystems because Again, societies are ecosystems. So what happens when we remove native disturbance regimes, keystone species and native habitat from a region and introduce novel disturbances, invasive species and gray infrastructure or ruderal habitat to the region? Ruderal meaning waste habitat, which has been, or the, the, that context has been destroyed. So here we're seeing a lot of Northern Indiana, which is a great example of ruderal habitat. Well, if the climate is right, species that might even be endangered in their native range become conquerors in their newfound range. Water that once allowed for prosperity now can wreak havoc and destruction. The soil that once provided for everything now poisons anything. Invasive species are an ongoing tragedy worldwide, on par with climate change, perhaps, according to some. Here in Chicagoland, the problem is so bad that lots of folks here don't even know there's a problem. They might not know that when you look into your woods, you're supposed to be able to see well into your woods. They might not realize that the enemy even prospers in their own backyard. Very cunning of them. Um, thus, most of our remaining woodlands, savannas, and prairies have succumbed to waterway alterations, soil compaction and removals, and a small handful of exotic uh, invasive grasses, forbs, and shrubs. Sounds intimidating. Well. It is from an ecological perspective. And I do trust that as people realize their dependence on ecosystems, they too will see these shrubs, these floods, and all that gray infrastructure is awfully intimidating. Right here, you can see um, just entire swaths of fields overtaken by Phragmites, which is an invasive reed um, that comes from the Indian subcontinent and the Middle East. So invasive species, let's start with the most visible problem. These exotic plants did not grow up with the organic associations that native organisms establish. There's native invasives too that capitalize on changes of climate or water or disturbance regimes, but we're mostly gonna focus on the exotic ones. So native organisms like this little guy right here are dependent on other native organisms, whether to control their population like this weevil does for its host plant, which is Baptisia or lead plant, uh, sorry, not lead plant, um, <laughs> wild indigo. But uh, they can control their population or expand it. But if you strip those associations away and you've got plenty of perfectly useful plants that don't belong here, making of themselves destroyers and usurpers, curse them. Um, in fact, they tend to form what's called a monoculture, where they actually turn their ecosystem into a novel ecosystem that's uninhabitable to most other things. But we cannot afford to treat the undeveloped land as useless land. 
Only the invasive species and our neglect and abuse make it useless. So right there on screen, you got a perfect example of a monoculture and um, an example of what you should not be seeing when you look at a woodland. You should be able to see into the woodland. You look right there, it's nothing but buckthorn. Um, very dangerous, yes, keep out. So surely taxes and labor and engineering uh, can fulfill some of these ecosystem services like we already have them doing, but what about all the other niches that need to be fulfilled, all the other chemicals and pollutants and nutrients that need to be broken down or created within all of the layers that comprise an ecosystem? Will your food grow without that? Will your air even be breathable? Will you be safe from natural disasters? There's just too many layers to handle it all by ourselves, especially in our soil. So earthworms are an invasive species that muddles up the natural layering of our soil in this region, um, bringing decayed matter like you see here on screen from the top of the soil matrix down to the bottom for themselves. Uh, and a lot of people don't know that, by the way. Earthworms, there are native earthworms um, south of Illinois and as you get into the deep south and everything, but here, because of the last glaciation, the last wave of glaciers that came through, there's no earth, no, no native earthworms in Illinois. So if you see earthworms, go ahead and use them for fishing bait or something. We don't want them. Um, but so all that dead stuff on our wild floor really is food, home and building materials for really every organism you can or can't think of that interacts with the wild floor. And worms can just eat years and years of it in a single summer. Invasives create negative disturbance as much as they exploit it. That's especially a problem with some of these mesificators like buckthorn, shade loving plants that overtake a fire dependent community. They, in particular buckthorn, have a hard time without nitrogen, but earthworm poop has lots of it. So together, Earthworms and buckthorn can destroy millennia of ecological work in a measure of decades or less. But it's not all about the stuff in the soil. It's about the structure. Right here you see buckthorny soil. It's very compacted gray um, soil with no porosity in it. Prairie soil, for example, is ought to be super porous. It, it's light and it's fluffy. So all that water and air can really get inside of it. And you're gonna see prairie soil occurring on screen here shortly. Um, that structure is designed by the deep roots of our native plants and fungi. So take a look at that right there. This is uh, some prairie soil that's been frozen and the fr frozen water actually shows you the pores within the soil. You can see that, that it's mostly water. Um, in fact, it's uh, our prairie soil in high quality prairie is about 50% air. So. The, the water replacing the air though makes a much, much nicer diagram. Um, so most invasive plants like buckthorn, they don't make room for either uh, the, the water or the air with their heavy shallow roots. So the soil just kind of collapses underneath them. It compresses and water doesn't sink away nicely. The mesificated forest also keeps that water from evaporating, which is why we have so many uh, mosquitoes. Do, do you like mosquitoes? I didn't think so. Um, there you go. You have some real fluffy prairie soil with uh, my hands digging in it. By the way, that rock that's next to me um, in this shot is a glacial erratic that was also deposited by the glaciers, fascinatingly. Um, so onwards. Did you all decide if you like flooding or not? Cool because we're gonna really nail that one in right now. As we discussed earlier, soil, a renewable resource, takes millennia to make. We've already lost most of Chicagoland's good topsoil to development. So the very context of our ecosystems and the stuff that upholds it and from where it's derived, every compound that composes it is in deplorable shape. To reiterate, different layers of soil need different plant roots to let in the water and soak it up. A lawn or a pavement or concrete channels like you might have just seen on screen there, um, or a monoculture of buckthorn won't do this. They, they won't let the soil in and air the water into the soil. And where have you seen a buckthorn monoculture before? Oh yeah, in floodplains and on Hickory Lane. That's just great. Uh, so floods deposit their excess sediments and nutrients in floodplains and wetlands, but when buckthorn is present, Flood, the flood might take with it more soil than a deposit. So you can see on screen here, the steep, steep shelf of soil that's been worn away. Or if it travels through hard surfaces, like right here, 
or contained areas, it speeds up too fast for plant roots and mud to soak it up. So it erodes the sediment further instead. And you can see this taking down entire trees as a result. Um, where does all that sediment go? Some of it ends up in culverts and stormwater pipes. So water can't come out that way. Some of it, like right here, creates big muddy plains on the bends of uh, streams, which forces the water to move even faster, causing more erosion. And some of it ends up on the bottom of the stream, forcing water upwards, causing more flooding. It's, it's just great. Um, this is something that must be considered with any development whatsoever. We all live in a watershed, so we all pay the price for poor hydrology. We must always consider what happens to water when built. Where will it go? How will it behave? How will that affect the ecosystem? How do we keep hydrology from hurting us? What I'm saying here is the same, that we need biodiversity, that intact wetlands and floodplains. Sorry if you uh, wanted that riverfront view, like right here. Um, it wasn't meant for you. And I, I don't mean that you aren't supposed to be there. I mean, like you're really gonna regret it. Um, in and out of floodplains, we need less impermeable surfaces and more natural areas to hold excess water. Think bioswales, artificial wetlands, emulated prairies, and rain gardens in lieu of retention ponds, gutters, and storm pipes. When any kind of development is built, Someone somewhere is dealing with a flood. Even when just making a driveway, consider forms of pavement that allow water infiltration, which also allows the swelling of the soil. So you use less pavement and it gets less damage. Are you planting a new garden? Maybe you should for that spot in your backyard where you always get a free in-ground swimming pool. Um, you want a variety of root systems to loosen up the soil and drink up the water. And if there's not enough of that nice organic matter lying around, then you probably need um, some pioneer plants, some live fast, die hard kind of plants. Most importantly though, you'll need some time. Um, so here you go, there's some more pictures of Wolf Road Prairie taking a bunch of the flooding off your backs. If you live in Westchester, um, your flooding is a, a, a lot reduced, sorry, your flooding would be a lot worse if this prairie wasn't here. Like a lot, a lot worse. And we'll kind of get to that later. I'll be able to show you. So it takes a lot of time to make soil, like I just said. It also takes a lot, uh, very little time to destroy it. Right here on screen, you see a year after an ATV drove on Wolf Road Prairie, which is very, uh, very illegal, by the way, it leaves a scar. And that scar is still there to this day. And it probably will still be there for years to come. So for all the time that ecological processes take, however, we can really speed things up. First of all, leave the leaves. That includes autumn leaves, grass leaves, and the dead stems in your garden. Uh, don't even mow it. Remember how I said all that dead stuff on the woodland floor is you know, food and shelter for all the organisms that interact with the woodland floor? Well, you'll mow those too. <laughs> And a lot of those organisms are making that stuff into soil, essential nutrients. So we can do a lot better than lawns. How about temperature regulation, no, huh? Not your HVAC, I'm talking about trees, Hickory Lanes trees, which we're seeing on screen right here. Tree cover saves up to 30% of your energy costs for the same reason that it reduces global warming. It reflects radiation, cycles moisture, and filters water. Um, and healthy, mature trees, can add thousands of dollars to your home if you're selling and value to your home if you're selling. So keep that tree alive by planting native plants around it, a community with which to interact um, and from which to extract nutrients. This is called a soft landing, an area around a tree where a natural community is allowed to thrive. And the tree will be thanking you as well as you're thanking it. Um, because trees don't live long without those communities. Developers tout replanting trees all the time, but they'll hardly give the tree what it needs. It's as good as propaganda. So keep a diseased branch out of your roof, keep your trees healthy, and your air at the same time. You may have heard before about carbon sequestration or carbon storage. Just about any plant does this. Oh, yeah, there's some more prairie soil, nice and fluffy, yeah. Um, but just about, yeah, any plant performs carbon storage. These processes are intertwined with the same processes that cycle nutrients in general. So we'll kind of use it as a framework for that. In some plant communities, 
are much more efficient about this than others. Besides requiring minimal care and expense, our native grassland and wetland plants, the kind that make a prairie, are the most cost effective in scalable forms of carbon sequestration available to us. It's, it's by far the most efficient way to store carbon is by building more prairies and wetlands. And again, they're the best flood control that we know of. You can be helping out the whole world by just planting native prairie plants, all thanks to that natural disturbance and that artificial disturbance. Those root systems, they uh, transfer most of the carbon they drink from the atmosphere underground as long as no one digs it up. But they think too about how much carbon it takes for those plants to grow, for all of that top growth to occur. And then every single year, all of that top growth dying back into the soil and decaying back down into those root systems. Um, with permanent ponds and wetlands, this effect of carbon storage is increased because all of that carbon is really sealed away, centuries of it sometimes. So think about what happens when we drain wetlands and floodplains to make more room for development. That's a lot more carbon that isn't accounted for in our vehicle and construction emissions. So trees are pretty good at carbon storage too, but they take a lot longer to do it. Different species working with different layers, it's that whole thing. So trees aren't the best at everything, but they sure do more for us than we can imagine or quantify, though some have tried to quantify it. The US Forest Service put together a comprehensive tool um, a comprehensive and long developed tool called iTree to quantify this financial cost savings of all the trees in numerous American towns, including Westchester, Illinois. And now scientists agree that those estimates are heinously conservative. Um, even so, negating cooling and moisture cycling, they found all the trees in Westchester annually save the village, the, the prices you're seeing on screen right now. Um, why is that conservative? Well, because it doesn't account for medical costs saved by easier breathing and safe water. Let's go back to that a little bit so you can see it. Um, it also uh, doesn't, it doesn't account for insurance reductions because of less flooding, less natural disasters and whatnot, nor every poison and pollutant that these trees are mopping up, nor the medical costs that are saved by just having less carcinogens and stuff like that around. The list goes on and on. Um, moving on, with these services at stake, everyone can benefit from considering their disturbance. Everything we do causes direct or indirect disturbance somewhere. But as we discussed already, many of those can be bad, privately profitable disturbances, or they can be good, publicly profitable disturbances. While there are some disturbances that stewards can emulate alone, there are some that need the support of everyone as a steward if we're to get the most services from our green infrastructure. One of the greatest reasons that Chicagoland's wilds are suffering right now is because of a lack of fire. Fire prevents this mesofication process that I spoke of earlier, but it also does wonder for wonders for all that nutrient cycling, all the good stuff that's locked in the dead plant material is given back to the soil instantly. Certainly there is a, a cost to this as much of the above ground plant matter is turned into you know, smoke in the sky, but it is a temporary deficit of air quality that results in a long-term improvement of air quality, especially because most of that carbon is already stored underground and storage capacity is increased after a fire. So take a look at what happens to a prairie the year after it's burned, which will occur on screen right now. So we'll see a progression going through the spring months here as everything comes back from a fire. You see that? And then this is after, um, this is at the height of midsummer where the, there's the greatest plant density that we can track all year round. Um, this year, by the way, at Wolf Road Prairie was the most biodiverse and the densest year and had the most um, frequent occurrences of dozens of species that have ever been recorded. And a big part of it is because we had such an awesome and comprehensive uh, prescribed burn in the early spring. So the benefits there, this is no joke. This is, you can see them right here on screen. So. Um, 
The capacity of this prairie to sequester carbon and clean the air is so dramatically increased that those costs are worthwhile. Remember that natural disturbance regimes, or without natural disturbance regimes, we have to be the disturbance. Unfortunately, you can't just burn all the buckthorn and honeysuckle. That fire will be big and unmanageable. But when we've cleared the buckthorn, uh, that's our time to burn. The cut stumps won't easily survive the burning, nor will other invasive plants, and the ash will fertilize a new generation of natives. However, the biggest impediment to this essential disturbance is, um, and green infrastructure at large really, is people and our reluctance. For fire, it's, it's quite understandable. People with lung problems should be cautious um, and you know, cars should drive carefully. That's all smoke in the sky, by the way, that you're seeing here mixed with the clouds. It's not just all smoke, but so, you know, it, it provides some, some credence to people's concerns about doing this, certainly. Um, but let me ask you, how do you expect to breathe when the air is saturated with artificial pollutants all the time? Um, just like the precedent native peoples, the burn bosses, as we call them, are exceptionally well trained in, uh, and in the area, they've never ever lost control of a burn. In fact, the more frequent these burns, the easier they go because there's less fuel to burn. So it's a much, much lower intensity fire. In areas that are more fire prone, this is the tool for reducing the severity and frequency of the deadly wildfires that we hear about in the news so often is having these prescribed burns to get rid of the fuel. Um, and also, by the way, in a lot of those ecosystems out west where these wildfires are happening, they are fire dependent ecosystems. These insane wildfires are happening because we, you know, because Smokey the Bear, more or less. Um, not to say that all wildfires are good, but we need some. Um, and around here, though, it's really the tool for uh, getting the most ecosystem services out of our ecosystems. And everything really does benefit right down to the little critters that you might not ever consider are helping you every day. Most invasive plants, as well as what are called ruderal uh, soils, do not support the invertebrates, the fungi, and the microbes that actually do the legwork of just about all of these ecosystem surfaces that we've discussed, whether it's making the structure or the nutrients. Every native plant has at least one critter that associates with that plant and just that plant. Oaks are the dominant tree at Hickory Lane have hundreds of associative species. Those critters, including about 60 species of fungi, um, those critters are capable of cycling the nutrients that the plant produces or consumes, or they help propagate the plant, establish it, control its populations, or help connect it with other plants with which can be traded nutrients, hormones, and more. Yes, plants and fungi do this. It's really fascinating. Um, by supporting even a small variety of native plants, the biodiversity of your home ecosystem is increased in exponents by all of those associative critters. Native organisms open opportunities for more native organisms. And as though it's like, it's like they know what's good for them. But species and their ecosystems and even the local hydrology need transitions like we see here on screen, um, which we call these transition zones or these buffers ecotones. Uh, the more we develop, the more invasive communities we tolerate, the more we separate ourselves from our ecosystems, the harder it becomes to get the best services from green infrastructure. So we, um, yeah, we have an oak savanna here that's over at Palos Woods. But we've all heard about European blue blood, right? That's a Habsburg, by the way, or dog breeds. How inbreeding creates so many problems for each of them. Well, the same thing is happening almost everywhere to all of our native organisms at once because of fragmentation. Uh, all organisms need to trade genes and keep the gene pool versatile and healthy. Even water needs more ecosystem to keep it clean and cycling nutrients effectively. Uh, and the decreasing size of natural areas means that more and more of their edges are exposed to the effects of humanity. So pollution and invasion, especially. An organism can't colonize ecosystems where they might better grow or ecosystems that might need the services which they can provide. By converting land into native ecosystems, we reduce the distance between sites that genes, uh, nutrients and resources need to travel. 
which means more ecosystem services. And by increasing the size of our nature preserves, we insulate them from future dangers and give more space for functionality and production, which means more ecosystem services. So here again, we got Palos, uh, the Palos Forest Preserve Complex, which is the largest uh, connected natural area we have in Chicago land. Um, so that's pretty good. You got a lot of ecosystems in just this one picture here. Even a bald cypress, which are very, very rare up here. Most of them are planted. You got some wetlands on the other side over there. You got a little bit of savanna um, on both the left and the right. And then right in the foreground, we're actually standing in a woodland uh, that butts right up against the this swamp that's starting to form with the cypresses out into a lake. Um, so what prevents this from working? When any ecosystem, no matter how degraded is developed, we diminish the ability of every other ecosystem to succeed. Urban ecosystems too. Especially in wooded environments like oak savannas, the profits never outweigh the costs, remember that. So when we keep buckthorn and honeysuckle uh, alive on our land, no, oh, it's telling you that that's, there we go. That's number two Hickory Lane owned by the developer Gallagher and Henry. Um, so when we keep buckthorn and honeysuckle alive on our land, not only do we lose most of those ecological services where they're most immediately matter to us, like controlling floods and having clean air and filtering out pathogens and toxins from the land, but we neglect the fact that complacency is not in action. By doing nothing about a problem of which we're aware, even when something, anything, is within our power to be done, we allow harm to come of that problem. Buckthorn and honeysuckle and multiflora rose and black locust will have a foothold on our land and be that much closer to another ecosystem which they might colonize and destroy. Like here, you have the structure of an oak savanna at Hickory Lane, but um, in, the for in the background and in the foreground, you have just tons and tons of little stems of buckthorn with the golden rods and some of our native plants struggling to get through it all. Um, so, at the same time, developing unprotected land in a natural area, even if parts of it are protected, always jeopardizes that natural area. It increases floods, pollution, invasions, overheating, inbreeding, and more. But uh, every time green land is developed, a developer gets rich, but society is poorer for it, sicker, more disaster prone, and deprived of something that helps all of us, as opposed to the private profits which will only help a developer. Instead, we can work on closing the gap between um, our healthy and functional ecosystems. We can focus on insulating and protecting what we already have. So here you've been seeing a little slideshow of a plot of Hickory Lane that is due for development. And we're gonna get to that pretty shortly here, but let's look at the current context of things. A lot's changed over the years. The conditions that forced our native species to be so efficient in dealing with the conditions that climate change presents are under a lot of strain or have been removed entirely. So we have, uh, we, we have to make do with what we've got here, kind of. Uh, we have to make the best of it or the worst of our future will be a lot worse. We can't always restore remnant ecosystems. More often than not, the original context has been destroyed. That being said, what do we aim for when, um, when we restore our green infrastructure remnant or otherwise? We aim for what's called functionality. And here on screen, we've got another cypress swamp over at Salt Creek Woods, just looking gorgeous. Um, and also swamps being a wetland are one of our most functional ecosystems that we have available to us. So we aim to create conditions using native communities which uh, maximize the ecosystem services and emulate the cycles of water, air, carbon, nitrogen, and all the other uh, essential nutrients to life that our native remnant ecosystems handle without anyone making them do it. With so much gray infrastructure at risk, as well as green, we can be selective, strategic, and scientific about where we establish green infrastructure. Where are the services most needed? Uh, who, to whom are they most important? The, the, these choices are within our power. The slate's a lot more blank than you might think. 
Cook County has a declining population and countless vacant developed areas that can be made into better developments as well as undeveloped areas that are more valuable undeveloped. And here on the south side, we have plenty of examples of vacant rural land that's just waiting for us to use it. Um, but what about at home? Maybe you like the privacy your invasive hedge provides and that's more than reasonable. Maybe you just like having something green or you can't facilitate the efforts of ecological re restoration on your own home ecosystem. Well, for what you get from these plants like buckthorn, there are most certainly native plants that can outperform those services and many more. Just ask any naturalist or check out the native plant finder or healthy hedges brochure, which I'll throw in the chat when, um, you know, when I'm not multitasking. So, <laughs> um, so on screen here, you're going to see a few of those options like cephalanthus, hazelnut, and dogwood. Plus, our native ecosystems are actually less supportive of pests like mosquitoes and ticks and earthworms than that buckthorn hedge on, on Hickory Lane. And native plants will support the native predators like this dragonfly here that further control our pest populations, you know, in case you needed another reason. Um, so those services should really be important to you. There's pollution everywhere. Air pollution falls down into our lungs and soil full of cancer-causing agents. Uh, storm water running over miles of pavement carries every bit of litter and poison with it, possibly into your backyard. Forgotten waste dumps, there's algal blooms, there's factory pollution, you name it. Uh, not only by restoring green infrastructure can you mitigate the effects of these things, but it's scientifically proven time and time again and with numerous different methods that just having a variety of plants around makes people happier. It makes towns safer when it's done right. It, people learn and heal and grow faster with green space around them. It just makes day-to-day -day life easier. So we are social creatures and we respond not just to having other people around, but all other forms of life. And it's not as hard as you might think to make a difference. For one thing, native seeds can kind of just be collected all over town in alleyways and gardens and roadsides but not from nature preserves. That's poaching. Trust me, walk through an alley, go through the park, you will find plenty of native seeds to use. And then they can just be sowed into your garden or more charitably into any suitable landscape. Here's my sister and I um, spreading milkweed seeds on, um, on our mom's property out in Michigan. So there, there's, uh, not to mention though, that Chicagoland has one of the world's most bustling naturalist communities. There's tons of people out there, including myself, who want to help you, or at least help you learn how to help yourself. Native plants, they don't, they don't need a lot of attention. Even if you paid someone to do the work, it wouldn't be nearly as much as a landscaper does because it's not landscaping. It's not a garden. It's not just for recreation or status. It's restoration, like you see on screen here, and it's necessary infrastructure. And even if you can't help stop a development or you can't get rid of the invasives on your land, you can still support native plants with little to no effort. You can even just help broadcast native seeds while you're strolling around town. Uh, you can heed the experts' calls to action, uh, support edicts and politicians and businesses and products that are environmentally sustainable. You can start conversations and just get the idea into people's heads that these everyone lives in an ecosystem everyone, no matter what. And that ecosystems are infrastructure and that this infrastructure is uh, in a more dire state right now than any residential road, I promise you. So now um, get to the real key of this whole presentation. When it comes to preserving what we have, that's already quite a fight sometimes. Um, because not a lot of people know how valuable these natural resources are. So not a lot of people fight for them. I can tell you from personal experience. So let me wrap things up with a story. In spring of 2021, a proposed development next to uh, Wolf Road Prairie State Nature Preserve, where I'm a steward, uh, threatened to destroy 15 acres of remnant oak savanna at Hickory Lane. As you can see on the map here, it's the highlighted area. The prairie is right here. But, um, south of Constitution, east of Hickory Lane. And these are the Hickory Lane buffer lands straddling, you know, what's marked here as Hickory Lane, the blue area, again, that's the 15 acres that are threatened for development. Um, 
it's 15 acres of remnant oak savanna with just one big old dilapidated house rotting in the middle of it. Um, fighting this development proposal was one of the most challenging things I have ever done. I won't even get into all of it, but it taxed my time, my personal life, my relationships, and worst of all, it almost made me hopeless. And while I've been accredited for spearheading the project by some folks, I literally couldn't have made any headway if it weren't for folks like you. My most important task was getting people to, like you to know what I know and to believe in what I believe in. And it was harrowing, it was beautiful and rewarding to see all kinds of people come together to stop this development proposal. So what's so important about this land? Well, oak savannas are one of those necessary transition zones, those ecotones that we talked about that promotes the movement of resources from and to prairies uh, into other ecosystems. These oaks do a lot for us. One acre of 10 year old oak woodland produces sufficient oxygen to support two human beings for a year while mopping up the emissions of almost three average American cars. Trees near to our roads, like the ones near 31st Street here at Hickory Lane, absorb about 60% of particulate pollution in the air that passes them. Considering these effects improve with age, the 15 acres of 200 plus year old oaks in question are keeping people alive with their oxygen and carbon cycling. And being near paved areas, these oaks do most of the work of recharging groundwater and reducing runoff. Uh, by the way, what you're seeing on screen right here, I'll rewind a little bit. This is a remnant oak savanna. So this is one that is actively being restored. Here we have one at Salt Creek Woods and then the next shot's showing one at Wolf Road Prairie. Um, this is what we're aiming for with Hickory Lane. If we already have acquired some of the land there, but for what's owned by the developer, we are trying to restore it to this, basically. This is what it could look like. I, I think a lot of people could agree that that's a lot cooler than having um, townhomes for $1,400 made out of the worst materials you can imagine. And that's, um, that's, that's not just exa me exaggerating. You can, you can check out the developer for yourself. Gallagher and Henry is their name. Um, so anyway, uh, let's see. Despite all of this, Cook County has only about 17% of its former oak trees remaining. And if you think that's bad, well, we're supposed to be a prairie state. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. But um, of the 22 million acres of prairie that covered Illinois 250 years ago, only about 2,600 acres remain. 22 million to 2,600. That's 1% 1 of 1%. If all of the prairie, the old prairies in Illinois were represented by Wolf Road Prairie at 76 and a half acres, 1% of 1% would look like two parking spaces. So look at this map here. That's Wolf Road Prairie proper. That's 76 and a half acres in that screenshot. And if you look up in the north, there is a little, little tiny few pixels of red. Um, that's, that's 1% of 1%. I just, just take that in for a second. Um, <laughs> so remember, we're talking about the most efficient forms of green infrastructure available to us. And one of the densest and most biodiverse ecosystems in the temperate world, comparable to much of the tropical world. And I'm not stopping there. These 15 acres of oak savanna were chock full of carcinogenic and neurotoxic compounds back in the 90s, um, thanks to a former landfill next door and uphill. So you see right here on the map, there's Wolf Road Prairie marked again. And this area that looks like a golf course, it, it is a golf course, um, that is built on top of a former landfill. And it also happens to be the highest point in Cook County. So um, all of that water that falls on that golf course comes eventually into Wolf Road Prairie, which you'll see on the watershed map coming shortly. Uh, so along with those carcinogenic and neurotoxic compounds were loads of methane, which is an asphyxiant and a greenhouse gas 26 times more powerful than CO2. In the soil, however, 
The green infrastructure already present, no matter how degraded, cleaned up most of those toxins by 2019. It's a testament to green infrastructure right there. It's like they were never there. However, in the odd outcrop of near surface bedrock, uh, which there is in this clearing that you see right here between the trees, that's why there's no trees there, is because there's bedrock about six to 15 feet underneath the soil. Um, we have no clue if that's the case. We do know that it was infected, but we don't know if it's gotten any better. Uh, and we do know also that dolomite bedrock, like we have here, likes to retain methane much longer than soil. We know that methane likes to transport other chemicals, uh, including the ones that the, these carcinogenic and neurotoxic compounds that were detected. And we know that groundwater can help move it into other soils. So what happens when we remove the soil, like a developer had already begun to do right here for I don't know what reason. Um, well, the compounds therein come out. So here you see, there's a diagram of our 480 acre watershed showing just a small portion of it actually. Um, that's not the whole thing. But uh, as we go on here, you'll see that this is especially concerning when this oak savanna in particular, this, this site owned by the developers is at a critical hydrological intersection. Um, I'd like to note that this map is very oversimplified. Uh, this was not, this map wasn't done by a hydrologist, but it, it it's pretty handy for showing what I'm talking about here. So these arrows show the water flow. Um, it doesn't all flow north once it comes uh, once it discharges from the landfill. A lot of it will um, pretty much just go straight east into Hickory Lane. Uh, some of it does flow north, but we're talking more from you see these plots right here. Talking more from these forest preserve, these plots labeled FPDCC just south of Ashley Woods. Those ones drain right into these retention ponds, which then drain into our prairie. Um, and a lot of the water, about a third of it, will pour into our southern wetlands around what's labeled South Fork Tributary. Uh, and all of that water eventually discharges into the village of Westchester. So, not only would this development risk further polluting already polluted waters while destroying the means of cleaning it, it would ensure that such water isn't absorbed by the soil at this critical intersection, overwhelming the artificial boundaries of our wetlands at Wolf Road Prairie, which you'll see here shortly. Um, and causing floods where we have yet to see flooding before. Novel wetlands, so here you have our wetlands at Wolf Road Prairie, and you see what I mean by artificial boundaries. Wolf Road Prairie was attempted to be developed back in the 20s, and these, hence these sidewalks. Nowadays, they contain our wetlands and uh, they can only contain so much wetland. The thing is, a lot of people might be wondering, well, wetlands, they're supposed to be wet, right? Well, when we get these novel wetlands that form as a result of flooding and of water alterations, they form too quickly for native communities to establish. So they're almost always overtaken by Phragmites and narrow-leaved cattail and other invasive species first. But as we speak, the developer still owns the land and is writing another proposal that the village of Westchester is licking their lips to accept. Um, by the way, this is the fourth, this is the fourth proposal. <laughs> um, Skip ahead here so you can just look at the nice prairie as I wrap this up. But now I know that all of you are environmentalists, whether you know it or not, and all of you are stewards, whether you like it or not, and all of us live in an ecosystem, whether we care or not. So there is a lot you can do, a lot more than you realize, and it might be a lot less work than you thought. These ecosystems may have taken millennia to create, uh, but they were the cultural landscapes of societies, which have not disappeared, even if you don't personally know a member of them. Thousands of years of work that really, really worked. And with an uncertain future in which we might see a lot more flooding, droughts, blizzards, storms, fires, and more, all things which our native ecosystems were designed to handle, we're going to need help from the experts. And I'm no expert no, the native ecological communities are the experts. Our ancestors knew it. The native people of this land knew it. Listen to them. 
take advice from them, advocate for them, and if you can, actively try to support them, these ecosystems. Go out and learn about the incredible intelligence and capability of our native ecosystems, our native green infrastructure, and I hope it inspires you to be a steward of your own ecosystem, because we all live in one, no matter what. So, um, with letting this go on, if you can see it, if you're not experiencing latency, I am very, very thankful to Wild Ones for making this possible. And of course, to Save the Prairie Society for making this whole journey possible. You can follow Save the Prairie Society on Facebook and, and Instagram. You can volunteer with us on Saturdays at 1 p.m. at Wolf Road Prairie and subscribe to us on Patreon to help preserve green infrastructure and our local history. So if you want to know more about the peril of developing Hickory Lane west of the prairie, you can send me an email. I'll put my email in the chat and I'll provide you with a comprehensive research packet that I put together formatted by Annie from the Westchester Grassroots Garden Club that tells you about the ecological and sociological intricacies of the situation. And if you enjoyed this presentation, please follow me on Instagram at Wyatt E. Coyote, all one word, no caps, and on YouTube, like and share my content, and that'll encourage me to make a lot more of it. And I really do believe in each and every one of you. I hope that you share this presentation or at least just discuss it uh, in your own social circles. And just thank you so much, I suppose. Now I'll hand it back to Adrian and Laura. And stop sharing my screen. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Wyatt, that was wonderful. We're already having a lot of complimentary um, comments in the chat. Cool. All right. We do have a question. Yeah, let me have it. <laughs> Someone would like to know what is the seed bank like on the invasives? I think they mean how, yeah, how do they, what kind of a seed bank do they produce? Oh, of the invasive plants? Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting question, actually. With, um, with, with buckthorn in particular, uh, it is an allelopathic plant, which means that it actually, it, it's organic matter that it drops into the soil actually is full of compounds that um, combat other species. So they actually uh, prevent the germination of other native seeds in the soil. But for the most part, the, the seed bank is, it, it certainly will have some invasives besides buckthorn in it. But our native plants, again, they're used to all of these natural disturbances and artificial disturbances. So our native plant seeds are designed to last a long time. And in these invaded areas, these, in, these invaded ecosystems, we've seen that when we've cleared them, even after decades of invasion, native plant seeds come right on up. The, uh, in the most recent dense, dense patch that we've cleared, and also the last one that we cleared on Wolf Road Prairie proper, it uh, sprung up with about 35 different genera of plant species um, and third, if I'm not mistaken, I'm going off my brain here, but 32 of them were native genre. So, and, and the invasive ones were not particularly worrisome either. It was stuff like daisies um, and, and Queen Anne's lace, which, which on an a very well-established remnant ecosystem are not too much of a concern because they can't outcompete our natives, um, but they can be concerning elsewhere. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to add, though, that this, this is true of areas that have been natural and let go. If you're trying to restore a farm field, for example, most of the seed bank is destroyed because of all the plowing. So I just want yes. to add that in so that very good point. We, yeah, we understand the differences, you know, that it's really important to get rid of the buckthorn yeah. in these, in these air, natural areas and let them regrow. Hence okay. that distinction between rutural. Like rutural basically yeah. just means that yeah. though that context is gone. Right, right. Lots of weeds. Uh, okay, so someone asks, have you explored purchasing the Hickory Lane property? Open lands helps purchase properties. And thank you for your fight to keep it undeveloped. Thank you for uh, for your support. Um, but actually, yes, yeah, that's... Um, we're, we're keeping a lot of things a little confidential right now. Um, coming next month, you're going to be able to see a lot more of how you guys can help us out and what our plans explicitly are. 
but yes, um, that that's pretty much the route we're pursuing right now is um, is purchasing the land. We've we've explored some other routes, and given this developer and their practices, there doesn't seem to be another option, and they're not donating it. Um, <laughs> right. So yeah. <laughs> um, Wyatt, do you know what the value, the real estate, like what would the purchase price be? Six million dollars. Six whole million. Um, the IRS appraisal, the last IRS appraisal, which was done in 2018, I think, was 2.8 million. Um, and the but the six million figure isn't just the developer asking for that much. It's also because of the the zoning of the land. So they got it rezoned by the village of Westchester to allow for the highest density uh, residential that Westchester has available. Um, and there's no prospect of rezoning it back as far as we can tell right now. We've already gone through that discussion, but that could lower the price if it were to be rezoned. When, when did they rezone it to the high density residential? Actually, right before the last proposal was struck down, like, like a week before yeah. <laughs> um, the last proposal was struck down. So yeah. yeah quite intentionally. Uh, to make a barrier, yeah. But it's, yeah, right. And and if we want to, if people want to buy it, to to make as much profit as possible. Uh, no right. Matter what. Yeah. I mean, how wonderful to make six million without having to go through the problems of of constructing. Yeah, honestly, it, it's a it's really a, it's a hurt to our pride because um, we know that they're going to use that that money to purchase other bits of land that we don't want them to purchase. Um, by the way passively keep asking questions but in the chat i'm going to be dropping some of those links i mentioned earlier okay okay so you've got lots of positives uh so much info packed in this wonderful presentation prairie up thanks for the deep dive into ecology amazing you're so um, surprisingly optimistic uh thanks wyatt for time and effort it's uh, for my own mental health really i <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> no i i believe me i understand <laughs> yeah uh, uh, thank you for being such a passionate and effective advocate for Wolf Road Prairie. Um, uh, thank you. Ah, here's someone asking, um, what would you suggest to replace a buckthorn privacy hedge with native plants in a residential setting? And Laura put in the very good uh, link for healthy hedges, but but what are some what are some ideas for for do you have any good Thoughts? Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, and of course, it depends on your um, on your site and how ruderal it is, how much that topsoil has been removed. Um, if there is no topsoil and you're working with subsoil, which most of us throughout the neighborhoods and towns here are, um, your best bets are going to be stuff like sumac, um, specifically smooth sumac, not staghorn sumac. Um, there's uh, mulberry, box elder, things like this that, these are some of these native plants that um, in certain ecosystems can become a problem because they're so good at just growing anywhere. But when you're working with just subsoil and none of our actual prairie or woodland plants will actually grow there, um, these are a, a few of your best bets. But as you get further up the scale and quality of better soil, or maybe you've been mulching for a long time, or you have a, a, an established garden already, um, you can kind of work your way up the ladder. So there's also wild plum is a great one that they can also handle pretty ruderal soils. Uh, we got gray dogwood and a few kinds of dogwood. Uh, probably the most beautiful one is red osier dogwood. Highly recommend looking that one up. It's just a gorgeous plant. Um, hazelnut, American hazelnut's a good one. And there's lots and lots of species of willow that do great here. And uh, prairie willow is an example of one in specific that's slow growing enough that it's very easy to control, but also an extremely um, uh, beneficial plant for biodiversity. It's, it's a very early bloomer and it can grow, as far as all of our native willows, it is the most tolerant of dry soils. So you don't need like you don't need an area that getting flooded to, to necessarily grow it. Um, let's see, there's, we could go all over the map here, but I would say to start with looking into those ones, those will be some of your, your best ones. Do you guys have any suggestions too? Um, oh, elderberry, elderberry is a wonderful one that can grow in pretty much, that'll, you see that all over roadsides. You see those 
big white uh, tufts of blooms on a lot of our highways and interstates in, in around May and June, that's elderberry. Uh, it's a beautiful plant, also great for biodiversity and, and does well in a lot of rural soils. But, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's so many shrubs and uh, shrubs are, native shrubs tend to be eaten by deer in our natural areas. So yeah. if people can plant native shrubs in our gardens and our yards, we're actually um, providing more of a refuge for the birds and we're, we're helping the ecosystem that way. And it can, if you have a garden um, that you're worried about deer eating, surround it with native browsing shrubs like prairie willow and elderberry because the deer will eat that instead of your garden. Right. Um, so, okay, so what specific honeysuckle is invasive? Oh, um, so the two uh, or the three most invasive ones we have around here the, the number one is a more honeysuckle, a more honeysuckle. You'll see that one at almost all of our forest preserves. Um, it's got fairly lanceolate or fairly narrow leaves. Um, it, it grows very large, it's very robust and uh, not as ivy-like as most of our honeysuckles. Um, there's also a Tartarian honeysuckle, which has very round leaves um, or more chordate leaves as they're called. And it grows very low to the ground. Um, it's very dark and matte in color. Uh, and then we have Japanese honeysuckle. It's a, probably the least common of the three. It's, it's a way, way bigger problem in Southern Illinois. Um, if you ever get a chance to hike down in Shawnee or anything like that, you'll trip, trip on it once in a while. Uh, and because it grows like a creeper, it's, an, it's a little ivy that trails on the ground and sometimes down cliffs and rocks and stuff. But yeah, so really the Amur honeysuckle is the, the, the one big one you look out for. It's unmistakable once you, once you get the hang of it. Right, it's got that, those hollow uh, stems too. Um, somebody says smooth sumac is also a rock star for supporting migratory and ground nesting birds. Yes, indeed. Uh, let's see, I had a question actually. Oh, sorry, Mark, by the way, I just realized I sent all those links <laughs> to you directly. <laughs> There you oh, go. Oh, here we go. Okay, good. Excellent. Um, <laughs> Lizard, <yeah. laughs> All right, everybody pay attention. Here's the links. Um, uh, I, I had a question, though. I was thinking about what you were saying about the buckthorn and its effect on soil and how it makes the soil uh, lose its oxygenation properties and things like that. Yeah. After you cut buckthorn and you've, you've gotten rid of most of it, how mm -hmm. long does it take the soil to re sort of regenerate i mean does it take a couple years or well it uh of course depends on on how long the buckthorn's been there um but like if there is uh and it also kind of depends on where it grew in the first place so on remnant prairies and stuff where buckthorn is growing it doesn't tend to take that long but it's still a measure of decades no matter what so if we're talking about something a little more ruderal or something that's been a, uh, a little more degraded, I should say, um, as opposed to ruderal in this case, then we're looking at 80 to 100 years before the soil can um, can really reestablish its former structure in the worst of cases. But it is very dependent, yeah, for one, on what was there before, how long was the buckthorn there, and um, how quickly and how effectively are you establishing the uh, restored ecosystem? So if you can establish it within a matter of a few years and completely eradicate the invasives and um, there's no further means of soil compaction, you're not, there's, there's no erosion occurring, you know, really ideal conditions like we're lucky enough to have at a lot of Wolf Road Prairie. Um, you, you can probably look at something closer to 30 to 50 years, um, but these are all estimates. Obviously, I have not seen this myself, so I don't know, but um, this is from what I, have, what I have read, and just in general, it's not well understood. We just know that there's, there's very, very few ecosystems out there that have been restored from a buckthorn invasion that have um, fully renewed that soil structure. We, we just don't know. We weren't studying enough of it, you know, 80 to 100, 150 years ago when Buckthorn first got here. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, that's that's interesting because but but that being said, 50, 50 years can sound like oh, that's daunting. But on the other hand, it, it's the, the plants that are regenerating are actually regenerating the soil as they grow. And yeah. in the meantime, um, as my in my experience with woodlands, you can be thrilled to see the native plants recovering the very next yeah. year. And oh so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the soil um, is working on replenishing, but meanwhile the plants are coming back. And that's some of those shots I was showing in the presentation were of that place that we just finished clearing. Again, we're talking decades of buckthorn growth. From aerial photos, it looks like that the that particular buckthorn patch um, in the northern parts of it variously had been there 20 to 40 years, depending on where you're at in there. We restored it, we we cut away that buckthorn and um six months later it, there's 15 feet of sunflowers and, and golden rods over our heads it, it's amazing how quickly it happens so yeah. it's not as dire as it sounds no <laughs> right so are there any other questions anybody else um i have a question what how much do you so you have um on the plots owned by the developer where there's all of the invasive, how much does that bleed over into the restored sections? Well, it's a little hard to tell because a lot of Hickory Lane itself, because it, it, remembering from the um, the map that shows it, this mm -hmm. this number two Hickory Lane is off to the west. So there's a bit of a bit more of Hickory Lane buffering us from the development directly, but. Um, we do know that, yeah, like we, we have pretty persistent invasions of not just buckthorn and honeysuckle from there, but we're constantly, constantly doing battle with reed canary grass and phragmites that finds its way over from, uh, from Hickory Lane. So it's um, the reed canary grass and phragmites in particular, because they grow so quickly, are a concern. Um, and it's because of that, hydrolo that hydrology of the area. The, the water is transporting the seeds of these rather water loving grasses right into our wetlands. Oh, yeah. So they can get there a lot faster than the buckthorn can. Um, since buckthorn, it does spread by seed, but it's, it, it's most successful vegetatively reproducing. Um, but no, when you're, when you're looking at the grasses, the invasive grasses and forbs, it's a matter of, you know, months for it to get over onto our, our land. But, um, and we're, we're actually, we're still catching up with some of those invasions right now. Um, hopefully that'll be resolved. <laughs> That's interesting. I forget about water as a dispersal agent. I tend to think yeah. more of birds pooping seeds and yeah, so. Yeah, and even the buckthorn can be dispersed by water because it does, buckthorn does fine in flooded habitats. It doesn't need to be high and dry at all. Um, like I said earlier in the presentation, it loves floodplains. Um, and that's not just because of the flooding, it's because all the nitrogen there, but yeah. Yeah, the Des Plaines River and Salt Creek are amazing dispersal highways. <laughs> yep. I knew you hadn't forgotten that, Adrian. <laughs> Combined yeah, with the yeah. no. oh, oh man. man. Combined I'm, with 294. Oh. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm dealing with it in National Grove, that's for sure. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love National Grove, by the way. That's like my favorite spring ephemeral spot um in the area. Oh, that's yeah. very Nice. Whoa, just wait. You have to come next spring. Oh my goodness. You great. guys done a lot of work there, huh? Oh yeah, we sure have. We Ooh, sure have. I'm excited. Um, I see another question here. Uh, oh. it says oh, somebody yeah. Nadine is asking, I would like to eliminate a good part of my lawn. Good. Kill your lawn. Um, but I can't do it myself. Do you know someone who could do that? Um well the <laughs> Theoretically, myself, um, I do do some private restoration, but I'm not here to market myself. I would ask, I would tell you um, to look at, uh, maybe look at, I don't know actually if tall grass restoration does anything. Be, I think they really primarily work on ecosystems. Um, for the most part, you could pay pretty much any landscaper to dig that up. And then if you wanted to get in contact with my, with me, I could help you with actually restoring it into an ecosystem or providing you with um, the methods and, and the seeds and the tools, the species and everything. It looks like Candace here. There are landscapers specializing in native landscapes. Um, red stem, dig right in, good natured landscaping, Denise Sandoval. I would look into all those people because I'm sure I, I work on, on remnant ecosystems. So I'm sure they know 
a lot more about what about working with um, home ecosystems than I do. Um, so yeah, there. Thank you guys for bringing that up. I'm glad that that was a very quick response. I'm gonna look into those too. <laughs> we uh, also uh, West Cook Wild Ones does have relationships with a lot of these people. Um, not monetary, but just we know we know them. Some of them speak at our our talks, and you could also email West Cook Wild Ones, and we could send you an email back with some some suggestions. Uh, I, I'm not sure, Laura, did we put on our website yet a list of We ways? have a resource page, which I'm trying to find right now. I wish Stephanie were here because she could do it immediately, but I'll keep looking for that link. Oh, I see it right now. <laughs> okay. All right, great. Uh, yeah, we, we, every, we, we all encourage people to uh, reduce their lawn and plant natives instead, whenever possible. Okay. So, well, are there right. one, one last call for questions? And if that, then it's going to be over and out, I guess. Yeah. I love answering questions. Just ask me anything. Nothing's too dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is dumb. There is no dumb question. <laughs> How did you get started? Yeah. Um, I just always have wanted to. I, I, I lived in California for a while, but I'm a Brookfield native. Um, and I really wanted to... Um, you know, here in Brookfield, we have the Kiwanis oak savanna, which is just a little patch. And they don't even know if it was an oak savanna, but that's what they're going to aim for to restore it to, because there's just no um, no real prior data on it. It was previously owned by the Daly family, actually, um, and they didn't bother to take any ecological data. So <laughs> they're restoring it to an oak savanna, and that got me interested in oak savannas specifically, because I heard of how endangered they were. Then we moved to California. Um, and I just kind of knew the whole time I was gone that I had to come back and help around here. There's just, I've seen a lot of ecosystems. I've seen some pretty dramatic stuff and nothing is, speaks to me more and nothing is more, uh, hospitable to me than what we have here. It feels like it actually wants you here, you know, like humans helped make this place. So, um, and also by working near a city or you're, you're, you could potentially be helping millions of people. So I just, I came home. Um, I started studying. I'd done a lot. I'd done a fair bit of volunteering in, in California, but not a lot. So I got here and I just started volunteering. And once I got to Wolf Road Prairie, they were like, hey, we need a tree guy because we have savannas. And they um, they, they just they re reeled me in, you know, it, and before I knew it, I don't even know how it happened. Just at some point I was a director and then I was a steward and then I. Yeah. And now I'm here. <laughs> no, I don't I don't see it going any other way. <laughs> amidst amidst all the thanks and all of the the kudos kudos uh what work will volunteers do on saturday oh. wolf road prairie ah um so at this time of year this is the most this is the best time of year to be attacking buckthorn and honeysuckle we don't really deal with it um in summer and spring uh, or not not in uh late spring at least so we're going to be near the Prairie House. If you didn't know that, the, the Prairie Society, we're merged with the Franz Bush Heritage Project, which is a huge historical project in the Proviso area, and the Salt Creek Greenway Association. Um, but we'll meet at that Prairie House, 11225 Constitution Road in Westchester, and we can pretty much give you any job that works for you. We're not going to ask you to break your back for anything. Um, you could just sit there and cheerlead us if you want. But we're going to be cutting invasive brush. Um, we're going to need people to haul that invasive brush to a big old brush pile fire, which is really fun. Um, the, the fire, not the hauling. And then uh, we'll, we could definitely use people for just stuff like trash pickup. Um, we might start uh, making seed blends and stuff so we could use you for that. But really just do whatever you're comfortable with. We're, we'll accept anyone. We're primarily going to be doing the hard work, though, at this time of year. So, um, you know, bring bring any gear you have, any equipment you have, um, and uh, feel free to join us. Sign up on the Forest Preserve website if you can. <laughs> okay. Um, two more, oh, sorry. Two more. Oh yeah. Questions? Yeah. Uh, 
Are you familiar with anyone restoring city parkways in front of residential properties? And I should say West Cook Wild Winds encourage people to do yeah. that. A lot of people yeah. are doing it themselves. And yeah, a lot of people, and then a lot of villages and towns um, are doing it themselves. I've been working lately with the Brookfield Conservation Commission a little bit, and I, I would like to work with them some more. Um, but it's it's largely these like village by village organizations, you know, small small government kind of things um, that are have been the most effective with it so far. But we do have um, some foundations like conservation foundation. Someone mentioned open lands in the chat earlier with one of their questions. They're doing a lot of that work and um what was it there are there yeah there's a few private individuals who um who are doing the work but it, it really we don't see a lot of facilitation of this beyond the county level it's um it's a lot of private interests private individuals who are convincing their villages to to perform this restoration or foundations purchasing land and then stewarding it until they turn it over to someone else um but yeah, I know I know the city of Chicago though does have a program for that. Um, the The Chicago Park District has been taking some some pretty cool measures in the last couple of years to protect more land. And um, you should uh, yeah look into that. Look into like stuff like Montrose Beach if you haven't already. To, to maybe you'll find some leads there. Um, most of what I'm familiar with is just on a village level. Uh, and then. Oh, somebody else, somebody mentioned that they're doing that the same person that they're doing that in front of their building in Chicago, yeah. um, which is what brought you to the talk. Very cool. Yeah. Um, uh, if you could talk about Brookfield uh, hadn't been plowed in the past and contains deep native topsoil. Um, that, that's a yeah. very interesting question, uh, depending on when the when was the town built partly, but go ahead. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the town. Um, it, it is really nice uh, with restoring here because all of all the eco all the restoration projects in Brookfield um, they they have some pretty fruitful results you see that on both forest preserves and otherwise um, because anywhere that hasn't been built on before is is untilled good prairie soil more or less um, it's mostly buckthorn that's been ruining it uh, whenever there's development, though, we can't build on top of prairie soil. It's too porous and fluffy, so that's why they have to remove it. Anywhere there's been pavement or development, you're working with subsoil. Um, but yeah, if you go over to Kiwanis, uh, Oak Savannah, and Brookfield, you can see a pretty, pretty uh, diverse environment. Uh, there's most of the issues that are keep preventing further diversity is hydrological, so it's a deeper issue than. Um, just you know, removing invasives can handle, but yeah, Brookfield is a is a beautiful town, and you have a lot of people doing it by themselves. Just rescue more than most other villages that I've uh, explored a lot of, which is mostly just here in the Lagrange Proviso kind of area. Um, you see a ton of people with native plant gardens and like forest reserve certifications for all this work they're doing. It's it's pretty awesome. Um, and there's even bioswales in town and in our parks and everything too that have been provenly effective okay um, so we're coming to the end of our time we're a little over yeah. actually um, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, so uh, candace hopes that you'll give us ideas for how to effectively get the residents of westchester to become more aware yep of social media so that would be helpful yeah yeah and, keep keep pulling out next month <laughs> yeah and we've got okay we're we're doing the last question okay this is, this is it the last very last question Nadeel, you win the prize. Nadine, you win the prize. Um, if buckthorn is pulled as opposed to cut down, does the soil return to normal more quickly? No. Um, this is this is something that happens a lot with smaller species. Obviously, we don't think to pull buckthorn a lot because it's hard, but um, there's a lot of people that were with, with forbs and grasses where they think, well, we could just pull it out by the root and then we don't have to worry about it. Sometimes that's okay. Uh, it really depends on the context, but most of the time you don't want to do that because um, while most natural disturbances are great, soil disturbances are not. Um, and pulling it creates a soil an acute soil disturbance. And when you're pulling out a whole bush, uh, especially with buckthorn, which has, again, very shallow, wide, and dense root systems, you're creating a massive soil disturbance. So all you're really doing is making it harder to restore it and easier for other 
invasives, probably invasive forbs and stuff to establish there. So um, we try not to pull anything. Herbicide is always, is almost always the best answer um, is going to be herbicide. Yeah. Uh, responsibly used. We, we we're use very it. responsibly, very responsibly used. Like, right? yeah. like well trained. You know, um, very specific. Like you have to be very well trained with any specific application, with any plant, any context, any um, even soil or or hydrological context. You're you needed to hold another school, basically, hold another class on it. Yeah, it's so very. If you want to herbicide stuff, get a, someone licensed. Like any steward pretty much any steward at a forest preserve is going to be licensed to do it um and anyone who works for a restoration company as well and they'll they'll know what how to do it and the the least um harmful ways to do it yes uh, yeah very important. anyway okay so <laughs> thank you very much wyatt it's been very thank you <laughs> And uh, it's been great having all of these wonderful people here and great questions. Um, and Laura, this. yeah, I um, I, I, I was. Thank I'm, you, Wyatt. That was awesome. I'm very thankful to have gotten.